All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, Tyler Riggs here at Adobe. I'm hoping that you're able to hear me. I'd like to get a confirmation in the chat. We're going to get started in just a minute here, uh, but hopefully we can get a confirmation from the chat that the stream has started and you have audio and you're able to hear that. So if I can get a confirmation there, um, we will get started in just a few moments and I'll let everyone know a few details about today's session. So just one moment, please. Audio is perfect. We got a nice chair. Thank you, Taka. All right, we will have recorded video of the, okay, so let me tell a, a few things about some logistics for everyone before we get started here today. Uh, do appreciate everyone joining. Uh, I think this is gonna be super exciting. Uh, I'm gonna go to big video so I can talk to you all uh, a, a little bit clear and you can see me. My name's Tyler Riggs. I'm with the solutions consulting team here at Adobe. And this is an experiment. We're trying something uh, that we really haven't done before. Some of our colleagues on the Creative Cloud side have done these live stream workshops, uh, taken a little bit of an inspiration from the gaming world where people stream uh, their, their games. But what we're hoping to do is have fun and show analysis workspace, start from the ground up. What can you do in analysis workspace? Start building some reports, show you what all the visualizations are but really want to be able to help your organizations make more use out of this solution, uh, spread the word about how cool Analysis Workspace is, and give you a better foundation to start asking us better questions around uh, how you can get value out of the tool. So if, you, if your question today would be, what is Analysis Workspace? Hopefully your question two hours from now is, how can I do X, Y, Z in Analysis Workspace? And then we can really start helping you out in a, in a new way there. Uh, recording will be available. Uh, this is So this is being live streamed. One of the cool things about this is this uh, YouTube Live has DVR functionality. So what that means is you can pause, you can rewind, you can do everything uh, live if you need to go back, if we cover a topic and you want to go back and see it. Or if a colleague is joining late, they can rewind in real time and, and start from before. And then after the session ends, uh, it, the, the video will process and it will be available uh, here on, on my YouTube channel. And we're going to share it over to the Adobe Analytics channel as well. Uh, so uh, that absolutely a lot of questions have been coming in about whether this will be uh, available after the fact. And uh, we... Uh, Let's let's get underway here. So I have a few colleagues that are in the. Oh, I got some comments about the uh, the mustache. It is November. I was making a joke on Twitter that I should have scheduled this on December first, so I could have been able to shave that. But uh, we have Matt, Steve, John, and potentially some others uh, from our solution consulting team in the live chat to answer your questions. Um, it's looking like I might have a hard time keeping track of the chat as we go along. Uh, so uh, if there's anything that uh, we need to demonstrate, maybe we can circle back and John and Matt and Steve can collect those topics and. Uh, we can hit those. But let's get underway here and dive in with some analysis workspace. And don't worry, I'll remove my video if uh, it gets distracting for anything that we want to show. But I wanted to make this a little bit more personal as we dive in today. So uh, let's talk about what analysis workspace is and show you how to get into it. I'm going to start, we'll, we'll get into some more advanced topics as we continue through here today. Uh, but I want to start with the expectation because we have potentially more than, I, I'm actually, I need to look and see how many people we have on the stream right now. Um, you know, we have hundreds watching right now and more than a thousand registered. So I uh, want to start with the assumption that there are some folks here who don't know anything about analysis workspace. And so the where you get into analysis workspace, the way that you start to access this tool that was introduced into Adobe Analytics about 18 months ago is just right at the top left of your Adobe Analytics window. You have a little link up there called Workspace. Uh, pretty much all of your accounts, if you are a current Adobe customer, should have access to You should have this link and you should be able to access this. Um, Analysis Workspace was introduced into Adobe Analytics. Like I say, it was at Summit 2016, and it was introduced as a sneak. And Ben Gaines, right after uh, he introduced the sneak, said it was available in beta uh, to uh, to customers. So it was really cool to get that right away. And the whole idea behind Analysis Workspace was to create a 
uh, a reporting environment or an analysis environment that was super flexible, uh, super interesting for, for analysts to be able to play around with and manipulate their data in a number of different ways. Um, the, the analog to this in the past was ad hoc analysis, or it was formerly called discover where you had the ability to do things like unlimited breakdowns into your, into your data. You could have a, a set of reports that you built up and had saved in, in a tabular format so that you could come back and access the tabs later on. And the, the problem with Discover, and you still can use ad hoc analysis, it's still a tool that some folks use and enjoy using, uh, as a Java application that you would download and run off of the desktop. And Analysis Workspace is available inside the web browser. So you have, uh, you have the ability to uh, do everything right within the browser. All right, so I am in Workspace, and what I did right off the bat, I want to start with some foundational concepts here, is I created a new project. Everything in Analysis Workspace is project-based, and the, hold on, just wanted to make sure that we're not having some, some challenges here. This will be recorded. Someone asked if the video was looping. Um, if we have any challenges, I'll ask John or Steve uh, to, or Matt to text me because I have my phone here. If there's anything that happens with the video, please give me a heads up that way. That would be a, a good thing. All right. So we have a new project here. Everything is project-based, so everything that I'm about to build in these reports can be saved for me to come back with later. But to give you an idea of the raw ingredients that we're starting with, I have what's called a freeform table. This is where I'm going to build... Uh, my analysis and my analysis is going to be built off of the following types of ingredients and I call them ingredients I don't know if that's an approved term from Adobe product marketing but that's what I like to call them we have our dimensions we have our metrics we have segments and we have time elements and to help get you a quick understanding of what each of those are dimensions are essentially anything that you're tracking in your analytics implementation that is qualitative. So as I, if I click into dimensions and I can see the full list of, of dimensions that we're collecting, you're going to see things like uh, acquisition term, or it could be a campaign name, or the page that a user was seeing, or the browser that they're using. These are really going to be qualitative type dimensions that we're tracking about a user session, about a visitor, about the experience that they've been having on our property. So dimensions are qualitative where metrics are quantitative. Uh, everything in metrics is, a, is going to be counting, incrementing by one every time we see something happening. So a page view is a very basic example of a metric. Uh, we see another page view, we're going to increment the page view metric by one. So uh, that's dimensions and metrics. And then we have segments. We're going to do a deep dive into segmentation during today's session where we show you the segment builder and we show you some of the different types of segments and then show you how you can apply those to your reports to get a lot of value out of what you're building in Analysis Workspace. And then, of course, a time dimension allows you to apply the concept of time to your reporting. Do you want to look at uh, some breakdown data for the last day or the last 14 days or other, other different groupings of time? We'll play a bit with that today as well. So very quick to start off here. So I have what's called a freeform table here. I'm going to take my ingredients and drag and drop. I'm going to start with pages. So I bring over page. I drop that into the table. And now I have a list of all of my page names and it populated with the default metric of occurrences. In this instance, occurrences and page views are going to be the same uh, thing. So if I drop in page views there, you'll see those numbers are the same. Uh, I want to get rid of occurrences just because I prefer to think about this in terms of page views. So very quickly, I've built probably the simplest of simple reports that I could ever work with. Um, it's showing me a list of pages on my site and page views. But if I want to do some, bring in some additional data into this report, by the way, I should say that we are working with a e-commerce or a retail website type data set here, a company called We Outdoors. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about data in a, in a retail concept for most of the presentation today. Uh, I'm going to bring over some additional metrics here. I want to look at my orders. And you'll, I'll tell you in a bit why it shows a zero for most of those and shows everything on one page. Um, then I will talk, I will show, uh, let's do visits. And I'm going to look at, let's just do revenue. 
and revenue will probably show zero on a lot of those as well. Pardon me right here. There we go. Have some people emailing saying they're not able to access because they're probably trying to go to the Adobe Connect window. So if you have any friends who are trying to access this via Adobe Connect, it looks like I've got 42 people in the Adobe Connect room right now. Um, please come over to the YouTube channel because Connect was too small for what we were doing here. Our crowd is so big. We were too big for Connect, believe me. Um, sorry for that non sequitur there. I, I sometimes think I'm funny. All right, we, so now we have this report, page views, visits, orders, and revenue. Very quick, hopefully what I've illustrated there that you can drag and bring in these different metrics that you want to look at. Uh, we're looking at this in terms of pages right now. So one thing I pointed out, uh, orders and uh, revenue, those are showing zeros, right? For everything except for this order confirmation page. That's where it's showing me 2,081 orders, $1.8 million revenue. In, in this case, it's because we were, uh, we're recog that's where we're recognizing the the revenue and the order. So that that value gets passed into Adobe on that page. I'm going to show you a solution of how you can attribute uh, the orders and the revenue uh, to all of the campaigns or to all of the pages that helped influence that. I'll show you how you can uh, calculate that a little bit later in today's session. Uh, but I just wanted to illustrate that that's why you see zero for orders and revenue across all of those different pages. But where we'll change that, right now if I change from the page dimension to product so I'm going I just some searching and I'm going to pick the dimension of product and drag and drop that instead on uh, remove my pages now you're going to see orders and revenue populates so I can see my orders for every individual SKU that I have in my catalog I can see the revenue for every individual SKU that I have in the catalog and then of course the page views and visits on those product pages so the idea that I'm hoping to convey here is you're very flexible in how you can rebuild, drag and drop, change the metrics that you're looking at any time in your table. Now, the question you might have is, do I need to, am I limited to just one table and I have to you know, keep swapping in and out dimensions and metrics every time I want to look at something new? And the answer to that is absolutely no. Uh, if you wanted to turn, start to turn this into a dashboard, then you would have the ability to come to your left side here and there's uh, we were in the components menu. I call them ingredients. I guess the official term is components. Uh, we can go to from the components menu to the visualization menu. We have a lot of visualizations we're going to be going through today to illustrate what all of these are. Uh, but one of them is a freeform table, and I could simply bring over a new freeform table. And if I so if I wanted to see both pages and products on the same screen, now I can bring over the pages uh, dimension. If I need to do something like shorten this up so that I can look at them side by side, the nice thing is this is fully configurable for me. So if I drag that up so that it's not as it's not as deep, I can then I can also come over here and move that on the left side. I'm going to change this table and drag it over there as well. So what I now have is I'm starting to build a side by side dashboard so I can have both these tables. So think back to the site catalyst days where you're clicking through reports that are preset for you and pretty much your, your level of flexibility with them was you could add metrics and then you could do a level of breakdowns. Uh, here you can, you can build anything you want into the, into the dashboard. Uh, actually think about the site catalyst dashboard. You had like a two by three grid and your level of customization was you could make it a two by two grid if you wanted and you could put any reportlet in there that you wanted. Uh, this gives you a lot more flexibility. You could then set one of these as your landing page, share it out through, your, through the organization. We're going to be covering all of those different ways to uh, share the data out uh, through today's session. Uh, but just wanted to kind of introduce that concept for you right out front. All right. So we have got a couple of reports on here. The next thing I want to do, just as uh, introducing a couple concepts here, is overlay a visualization onto this as well. So I'm not looking at just tables. Uh, so I'm going to bring a line visualization. Again, we're going to play with a lot of these today. Uh, but I'm going to bring a line visual visualization over. And the first thing, you see a little pop-up here it shows me that it allows me to select a data source. So it's recognizing, Analysis Workspace is recognizing that I have multiple tables 
and it's going to ask me which table I want to visualize. And it's telling me there's freeform table and freeform table 2. Well, I should have named my tables so that I could stay organized, especially if I get into a scenario where I'm putting many 10 plus or you know a lot of different tables, a lot of different data into this workspace. I should give them names so that I can stay organized later on. So I'm going to call that one pages and I'm going to call this one here. Oops. What did I do? Products, orders, and revenue. So now, if I come back up to my data source, and by that, by the way, and this is something that I just learned. If you're a regular analysis workspace uh, user, I just learned this myself a couple of weeks ago when Jen, Jen Lasser, product manager, told me. You click the little dot at the top of the visualization, and that's how you get back to the data source settings. And so now I can select: Do I want to view the data, the visualization on pages or products and order revenue? And so I'm going to select that. Uh, and now what I have here is a visualization. You can see it's showing me page views, visits, orders, and revenue. And now the co kind of cool thing about these visualizations is they are dynamic. So if I select any product or any group of products from the, uh, from the chart that I'm looking at at any given moment, the visualization is going to update. So if you want to have that real-time view of of you know, the, the graphic representation of the data points that you're looking at, you're going to be able to do that at any given time. Uh, one thing else that I'll show you here in terms of the visualization is you have a few settings that you can configure, and these may vary from visualization to visualization. Um, you have the uh, line, uh, you, or you can change the visualization type on the fly, I can change the granularity. Right now we're looking at it on a day-by-day -day basis, uh, but if I wanted to change it to a week basis, I could do that. Uh, I also can uh, change it to percentages, and when I go to percentages, I can normalize my values as well. Let me actually just change the, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna remove my ugly mug from the screen for a minute so you can see all this. Uh, I can limit max items so that if I, I want to get rid of any outliers and then of course normalization if there's anything that's uh, if we're looking at page views uh, versus orders the scale of the graph could get really off so uh, we have the ability to do that as well so just a few different areas hopefully we, we've introduced the very basic of base concepts in analysis workspace how to get metrics onto a page how to get dimensions onto a page how you can reorganize the, uh, the workspace that you're working with, and then also how you can uh, start to overlay visualizations and configure the visualizations. And we're going to be playing with many different iterations of this as we continue through the presentation today. I saw a question from Adam in the chat wondering how, this, how we set up this, this screen share. I'm happy to share that information. I actually had a fun time getting this all set up. So I'll share kind of the setup that we used uh, here today later on. And I want to do more sessions like this if, uh, if folks are finding this is a, a good way to share content. I'd love to do more like this in the future. So happy to help uh, Adam and anyone else who's interested know what we did from that perspective. All right. So one thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to take a step back out. I'm going to click workspace. And so here you're able to see, I go back to my projects menu essentially, and we've just introduced how to create a project. And we might go back to that, but I can see on my workspace menu that I have a number of projects that already exist. So these are projects that are available on my own. Uh, but if we went to manage projects, uh, there's a link up here that says manage projects. Uh, this is where we'd be able to see uh, projects that are shared across our organization. So we might have projects that are shared at the report suite level. We would be able to see who the owners are of the different projects that are available. Uh, we would have we would have a number of different ways to be able to uh, see across our entire organization uh, who has what out there. And, and you can also have projects that are only yours. So you can have projects that are not visible to others. Um, that's that's important for you to be able to have. So that's one of the elements that we would see on the project management menu. You also have the ability to set a project as a landing page. And something that's very helpful for you is a takeaway. There's a handy link right here always that says view tutorials. Uh, view tutorials is going to take you uh, directly to the um, it's going to take you to the uh, YouTube page for 
analysis workspace. So the Adobe Analytics product team has done a tremendous job of building uh, short three to five minute videos that introduce a number of different concepts for you of how to do everything that we're talking about today in analysis workspace. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, the other thing that I want to highlight for you is over on the left side, uh, we have what are called templates. And templates are ways to get you started with something that's focused on your industry. And more of these are being added all the time. Uh, but the idea is if you don't want to start a, temp a workspace from scratch, we give you something to, to kind of start with. So if, for example, I wanted to start a retail workspace based on campaign performance, know how my different marketing campaigns are performing, I pop that open. And I have my dashboard built up with some of the different visualizations that we haven't introduced yet, but I can see things like rolling week over week revenue, uh, domains driving visits with tracking codes. I can see what those look like. I get down into some of the other visualizations that I have access to, which are things like the uh, uh, tracking code. I can see for users coming into the site with certain tracking code, start to understand how they are browsing through the site. And then I get down to another table, and this is where I can see all of my individual, um, all of my tracking codes. So search engine marketing campaign one to one, SMS campaign, uh, six eight eight nine five, and so forth. So I think someone had a question about the uh, closing the rail on the left side. You can do that, and you can it goes into auto hide mode uh, if you had a question about that. So this is an example of a template that can get you started up and running really quick. And so from here, I can start to do some deeper dives on my analysis that I'm working with at any given moment. So let's use this table that I have right here. Uh, this one's called Campaign Grid, showing me the different campaigns. And we're looking at the metrics of product views, cart ads, orders, revenue units, and conversion rate. Let's say that I wanted to start to dig deeper and find out, all right, here's email marketing campaign 902, 901. And by the way, you can use uh, Saint classifications to give these campaigns friendly names. If you're an advanced or a, an old time Adobe Analytics user, something that you can do here is basically upload a spreadsheet or a list of campaign names to go alongside. So you take the campaign tracking code and assign it a friendly name. Um, that way, if you have analysts coming in, you're not saying, hey, how's the email campaign 902-901 doing? Uh, what did Brenda do this weekend? Uh, I never watched Beverly Hills 90210, but that's what that campaign tracking code made me think of. Anyway, you could change it to say spring clearance email campaign or something more friendly along those lines. So that's a capability that does exist. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to take this campaign and I'm going to do the right click. Uh, this is, I think, our first right click inside Analysis Workspace. So everything inside the tool is functions in an application oriented way. Uh, so you, uh, you just like you were working with, whether it's Discover or Excel or something else, you can right click and get to a lot of additional functionality. So what I'm doing with email campaign 902901 is I'm going to do a breakdown and I want to see what products were ordered. Uh, so I could search through dimensions and get to products or I could just type products and it'll get me there and so I do this search and now I'm able to see all of the products that were viewed cart added ordered and the revenue the number of units and the conversion rate that was generated on all of these individual SKUs through that particular campaign so you're saying Tyler breakdowns in Adobe Analytics that's nothing new we could do that in site catalyst uh, but the difference between Site Catalyst and what you had in Discover that you now have in Analysis Workspace is the ability to do an unlimited number of breakdowns. So Site Catalyst, or Reports and Analytics as it's called today, limits you to one level of breakdowns. And here, now I could say, uh, let's break down Timberline GTX boots and let's break it down by cities. So I want to see where those orders took place. So I would scroll down here and select cities. And I think everything's going to happen in San Jose because that's where we're generating this fake data. But you get the idea that you could keep breaking down until you find nuggets of information that are useful to you. So this is helpful to us as analysts to be able to slice, dice, and, and quickly get to data and go down deep, as deep as we need to. But the question then becomes, how do we start to take action on that? What are some of the ways that we can 
not just allow this data to inform or give us a report that we can take to our weekly stand-up meeting and say, wow, we're getting a lot of orders of Timberline GTX boots out of San Jose. Maybe we should start targeting some ads there. We have the ability to either take these data points and do some further analysis on them, or if you're using additional Adobe Marketing Cloud solutions like Adobe Target, uh, you can start personalizing campaigns to users like this. So I could say, well, here's users who looked at or ordered boots. Perhaps I want to target a particular offer to them. So what you could do in that instance is you would simply select the criteria that had built that drill down you had done or that breakdown. And then when you say right click, you can say that you want to create a segment and we're going to take you right into the segment builder with all of that criteria in place up here at the top right we'll reiterate to you the numbers of people that fit into that particular segment that you are building but you can basically say this is san jose boots lookers mm -hmm. and with one click of making this a marketing cloud audience uh, you're going to be able to syndicate that out to other uh, marketing cloud solutions uh, so we're going to spend some more time in the segment builder in a little bit but I wanted to illustrate here that at any time, if you identify a subsegment of data that you are interested in making a segment out of, you don't have to remember it and go to the segment builder later on. You can just select it, right click, and then make a segment out of those exact, uh, those exact criteria for the users. Uh, so that is a, a pretty powerful uh, tool that we would be using in, these, in, our, in our analysis. All right, so we've looked at, at, at doing some breakdowns. We might come back and play some more with that. Um, we're going to spend some more time with the visualizations here in a little bit. Uh, I want to take a minute and just ask in the chat pod if there's anything that we need to uh, we need to focus, dive in, and show. I, I apologize. One thing I didn't anticipate was that it would be a little bit harder to monitor the chat pod here when we're presenting it this way, but. Uh, can I get a high sign from Matt, John, and Steve if there's anything that uh, we want to demonstrate real quick or take a diaper deviant dive in before we continue on? I also didn't expect there's a there's a little bit of a latency. I'm probably 30 seconds ahead of what you're seeing or what I actually see come back in the chat pod. So uh, please let me know if you want me to demo something a bit deeper hard to monitor chat pod okay uh, we had a question from James to see month over month or year over year comparisons so definitely let's take a look at that and to make this easier for me to kind of start from scratch I'm going to go back and I'm going to create a new project so I want to look at let's stick with products and orders and revenue because that's uh, good for us to be able to keep track of so I'm looking right now at Product, order, and revenue. Would love to understand how to get a good base of fake data into a report suite. That's funny, Lucas. Lucas's internal Adobe. I can tell I can tell you about that one. All right. So orders, revenue, and then we have our, our our table here. This is where we're going to introduce our time element. So if we want to start to compare, well actually there's a couple of different ways that we can introduce time elements into our uh, into our reports. Uh, I have at the top right of everything that I'm working with, I have my the time that I'm viewing uh, at this moment. So uh, right now I've got rolling dates showing me uh, this month. If I switch to the last 30 days or the last 40 days or you know whatever I wanted to select here, uh, I could have look at that on a rolling basis, and I would be able to uh, do that application that apply. But if I want to start to uh, break this down by different time elements, uh, what I can do here is I can come in and I can say that I want to create a new date range or I can use one of the pre-constructed date ranges uh, that already exists. So I'm going to look at this month versus last month. And I believe I should have last month in here. So let me find this month, see if I have that that exists. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to bring this month under each of these different metrics that we were looking at. And then I'm also going to bring over last month. I'll put those side by side. 
So this is probably the best way for you to build this uh, if I want. So I am now just going to be able to have, or at the top line right now, I have this month and I'm comparing it to last month. And then if I want to, actually, I, this, I'm learning something here on the fly. So this is one way to do it if you just want to uh, compare this month versus last month side by side. But let me remove last month. And what you can do is you can right click here and say compare time period. So I'm right clicking on the time element that I put in place. And I'm going to compare prior month to this date range. And that's going to give me uh, the comparison and show me the calculation of the percent change. So this is where we are able to uh, have that difference column set up for us. And I can do the same thing over here. So I can come over here now and say compare time periods compare to prior time this date range and I'm going to have that available for me as well so you could do that the same thing for uh, month over or month over month as you could year over year and then I can reorganize my columns here if I'd like to as well so there we go I had a chance to illustrate that for you you also uh, you'll notice that there is some colorizing that's in on these so we have for negative numbers are uh, red uh, for something that's near zero, yellow, and for green numbers, uh, we have the green. Let me remove my video here so I'm not hiding, so you're not missing all this. You have the ability to uh, do some, you can trend, I'm, let's see, I want to make sure that I, I get to this. If I come in, and one of the options that I have in here, and perhaps John or Matt, you, you might know this more off the top of your head than, than me, sometimes I lose track of where a lot of these capabilities are you have the ability to apply uh, visualization or apply the the color shading to the actual numbers uh, inside there it's escaping me at this exact moment where that that exact capability is but uh, you have the uh, you have that ability there as well all right so want to spend a little bit of time going over some of the different types of visualizations that exist inside the tool. I just want to scan the the chat pod here. Is there? I'm just going to scan real quick here. Let's see. I saw there was a comment in there about the uh, 200. So if you're exporting data from Analysis Workspace, there's currently a 200 row limit on your exports. So you have to go to um, report builder which is an Excel add-in to Adobe Analytics or to data warehouse to get more than 200 I know the product team is uh, looking at uh, expanding that or uh, removing that limitation but it's it, it's on the roadmap but it's also uh, there's some other elements that are uh, are taking priority right now but we definitely appreciate the feedback there uh, ch -ch -ch. I'm looking scanning through the chat pod here is there a way to create a last quarter one year ago segment that will always be relevant to the current report similar to pre-existing this quarter so if you want to create a segment uh, of a time element you do have the ability to do that so let's actually go into the segment builder and spend some time in there and show you some of the different capabilities or some of the different elements that you would have uh, inside with your with your segment builder uh, so Segments sit over here on the left side. If I click into segments, I'm able to see all of the different segments that are available to me. But if I click new and say I want to create a segment, that's going to bring me into the segment builder. Uh, we were we popped into this a few moments ago or a little bit ago where we were um, looking at we had a segment automatically built for us by right clicking and saying create a segment. Uh, but now we can come in here and create a, a segment of our own. So if I want to do, take, for example, a date range and create a new date range, I'm able to select an explicit date range. So let's say that I want to have a segment of Q4, what would that be, October, November, December 2016. Then I could come and select from, Q, or from October 1st to December 2016 and apply that date range. I'm going to call this Q4 2016 and save this out and now I will have that date range available to me to bring into a segment uh, so and I could then save that so if you want to save explicit date ranges uh, that you would be able to access later on uh, you certainly are able to do so 
Uh, but you have a lot of other ingredients or components that are available to you inside the inside the segment builder. You can essentially build your segments based off of the any of the dimensions metrics, or you can stack segments built. Uh, ex, ex, you can take existing segments and build those into your definitions, uh, and so you, you can start to mix and match. So one thing that a lot of people miss as first-time users that I want to be able to be sure to highlight here as well is if I take something like page uh, we are able to start all of our pages that are values that exist for us those will populate over here for us so if I want to uh, leverage any of the you know say users landed on home page I can say home uh, if I want to, same thing with products. So they, it will kind of it'll load all of the values that exist that exist inside the system that we've recognized. So you don't have to uh, do your own guessing or kind of you know thinking about what the values are. They will they will show up for you if they exist in the in the system. So we'll be able to add all of those. And so that's kind of what we see when we're looking at uh, the qualitative dimensions. If we bring over something like page views that's going to be a more quantitative element for us so if we're looking at page views on home and we want to say that the number of page views was greater than five or equals five or any of these different uh, quantitative values uh, we would be able to say that so if I want to say I want to only look at uh, visits I'm gonna come back to this that I that menu in a second visits where the number of page views on the home page was greater than five uh, that's where we would be able to see that and I, I always point you back up to the top right when we're building segments it's important to make sure that there's actually data inside that segment uh, we don't want to build a segment that's so small it's going to be useless for what we're trying to achieve at any given time and so here we are able to see the number of unique visitors the number of visits, the number of page views, and then also visitors with Marketing Cloud ID. Marketing Cloud ID is a an identifier that Adobe uses to uh, assign a unique or be able to exchange who an individual is between our different systems. That's how we can take an analytics segment and start targeting content in Adobe Target. We're targeting an Adobe campaign, email campaign to users is using the Marketing Cloud ID. If you're wondering there, uh, so I see a. Um, a question let's actually let's build this there's a question in the chat pod how can I view data by device desktop and mobile well you could build a segment um, that's so your device type would generally be a dimension that you that you are tracking so if I type in over here device and I have the dimension of mobile device type I can bring that into my segment and I can see is it an e-reader a gaming console a tablet a t is it a, a smart TV I would be able to build that into my segment uh, I also can have you know I could have dimensions that break that down into a into a deeper level what type of device is it uh, sorry what brand of device is it an Apple iPad is it an iPhone an iPod touch a Kindle uh, you have a number of different characteristics there so you would be, have the ability to build a segment uh, utilizing the either the single device the device type or a group of devices that you wanted to build into your segment I'm going to show you a nifty way in a few moments that you can skip this entire segment process and just kind of build that on the fly or do some analysis on device types so hang tight on there I'll show you that in in just a moment uh, so the, what, I, what I was highlighting here you have the ability to bring your dimensions your metrics your time elements into your segments I do want to spend just one more second on this little menu that I was showcasing here. This is what we call the container that you're using to build your segment, and it's really powerful. So think about when we're, when we're building a segment, we are essentially taking our full data set, everything that's been collected inside Adobe Analytics, and we are, uh, we're, we're taking that full data set, and we're going to start slicing and dicing it based on certain criteria and we're going to you know, filter out a given report that you're looking at based on the the criteria that you put into that segment uh, but we have a few different tools or grouping methods that we can use in making those segments and those are hit visit and visitor so think about a hit as a page view you want to break down uh, details about what happened within a single page view was there what did the page view occur on a certain page 
did a click take place on a certain page? So this is the most narrow of containers that you can use. You're really looking at a grouping behavior within a single hit, uh, whereas a visit is going to break down behavior that takes place across a session. Now, a session can be whatever uh, time period you define it as. Generally, we're thinking of if there's no activity after about 30 minutes, then it would be a new visit if someone came back. But did a viewer or did a visitor hit certain pages during a visit or did they complete an order during a visit? Uh, and then the, the larger container is visitor. That is looking at, you know, we, if you're, you're using, a, let's say you're using a first party cookie, so you're keeping track of the user across many visits. You're keeping track of that visitor and you want to know what kind of uh, material happens uh, when, you, uh, when you have that level of extensive history of your customer. Sorry, I was receiving a text message from a colleague with a question from the chat pod. Uh, so you have a, uh, you have the ability to view that behavior that you're putting into a segment at the visitor level. So over an extended period of time. So very useful to be aware when you're building your segments of which container you're using. And there's a, uh, there's a lot of documentation and there's a lot of uh, uh, blog posts and such out there that can advise you on what's the best to attain your objective at any given time. But it gives you, that gives you an added level of flexibility. Uh, one other thing I want to highlight before I pop out of the segment editor though, is that there is another element. Uh, so you notice that when we did this, we said pages are, are it's the home page and page views is greater than five. And we were using an end operator in that instance. Uh, but what if we wanted to say that the page equals home uh, and or the page equals, and I'm just going to select a random here, the blog get outdoors. So now I would be tracking, did a visitor hit either of these pages? So you have the or operator, but there's a third operator in here that is extremely powerful if you want to start to get sophisticated about your segments. And that is the time element or the then operator. And so in this instance, we would say a user hits the home page. And then after or within a certain period of time, they hit the blog Get Outdoors page. And so I could say after uh, one week, or I could change this to you know one minute or any any time element. Or and I could say also it doesn't have to be one; it could be nine minutes or you know, whatever you want it to be. They hit the the Outdoors page, but I could also you know come and say after seven minutes, but within one week. So think about the scenarios where this could be useful in your business. Think about if I let's let let me let me twist the the Rubik's cube here a little bit. Let's say I have a campaign. Actually, let's look at that on campaign name. So let's say we have campaign name and the user comes in on a particular campaign. Da -da -da -da, campaign's tracking code. Remember earlier we had campaign 90 something or the other. Don't want to search for it. So we would have a certain campaign. I got to find the right dimension that has the right data. My my report suite's a little bit messy. I'm a little bit embarrassed by it. There we go. So I have an email campaign, and we say that a user sees the email campaign, and then we want to know did they order within a certain period of time. So I'm going to say orders is greater than or equal to one. So I'm going to say after the email campaign, so after one minute of the email campaign, or let's say after one visit, again, this doesn't have to be a time element. It could be after one hit, one page view, one visit, and so forth, but within one week. So I want to know, did my email convert users within a week? I might compare this to a segment where I look, did that email, did people who received that email convert later on after a week? Uh, so there's a, a few different ways that you can start to bring time elements uh, into, into this, into, into your analysis. Uh, but that, that becomes very flexible for you. And the, the, the neat thing about bringing a time element into a segment is your, everything is in context of when the visitor saw the, uh, 
when the visitor saw the campaign or when they interacted with the campaign or they clicked through. Uh, so it, it, the after one hit, but within one week will be different time period for me than it would be for John Pesca uh, because he might have opened the email at a different time. So very flexible for you to be able to handle that. You have some options to uh, include everyone in this or include before or after certain sequences. Um, and then one other thing I'll just point out here, we won't dive into this much more because it's uh, different flavors of the same stuff, uh, but we can ha bring in additional containers. So I might be want to build a segment where I say, I want to look at users who saw email campaign 116, etc., and then committed an order or a totally different cluster of users. So you can have additional containers that are built into your segment to really flesh out how you're building out your segmentation strategy. All right, so we look at a few different elements uh, there and that ultimately we start building our segments and I have a number of segments that exist for me right here. I'm gonna clean up my, my table here and I'm gonna show you how we can uh, start applying those segments. So I'm gonna load a new freeform table and let's say that I have my, I want to look at some metrics here. So this is something we haven't done yet. We, so far to the today, we have been only bringing dimensions onto the, uh, into the columns view or as our rows within the report here. But let's say that I want to bring metrics over here instead. So now I'm looking at revenue, page views, visits, and orders. And by default, it's showing me this data in terms of all visits to my site. But let's say I want to start taking some of my segments and filtering down that way. So I have some segments that I've built that look at different marketing channels that users came into the site from. Email, social, paid search, and so forth. And so I want to bring those over now. So I'm going to look at email. I'm going to look at affiliate. And I'm going to look at social. So if I want to do a quick comparison of these different marketing channels and how they're performing across my key metrics, I'm able to do that. Uh, looks like we, we discontinued our affiliate channel campaign without anyone telling me. So I'm going to get rid of that so I don't have to look at that. Uh, I'll bring over paid search instead. And so very quickly, I'm able to take my key metrics and look at them across these different, uh, these different areas. And again, if I want to lay in a visualization, I'm going to bring over a bar chart on top of here. And now I have a graph that illustrates those different channels for me and how they're performing. I want to remove all visits because it's skewing the graph for me a little bit. And so there I'm able to do that. And I can see my revenue page views, visits, and orders across those different channels. So that is uh, what we can do in terms of bringing segments directly onto our onto our report that we're looking at. There is another way that we can do this though, another way we can utilize segments inside of our reports. And that is uh, at the top of any workspace that we are working with, you'll see there's a drop, drop a segment here or any other component. And so what that allows us to do is take a segment and we're going to filter the entire workspace through a segment. So down here, where I, whereas I was looking at segments side by side, let's say I want to look at only mobile device traffic through these different areas. So I'm going to bring over my mobile device segment. And now I'm filtering everything and I'm looking only at mobile devices. And so you see those numbers shrunk a little bit. If I get rid of mobile device, it's going to take off that filter and show me everything. And so you can, that's how you can filter an entire workspace if you'd like to at any given time. You also can nest segments. So if I want to look at mobile device and frequent visitors, I can have those sit up here side by side. So that's one way that we can do this. But there was a question in the chat earlier around what, what if we want to do some analysis around particular mobile devices. Uh, this is a, a really cool uh, feature that flies under the radar that allows you to start to create segments very quickly on the fly. So what I've done here is I've searched for mobile and I see mobile device dimension right there. And I want to I want to check to make sure that it's the right one. So I just click on the little left icon or sorry, the right icon. And that gives me some some details about the data that exists inside that data set. So I see that there's Apple iPad and iPhone and such. If I wanted to build a segment on the fly, 
of iPad traffic, I simply drag iPad into that uh, into that right there, and it's going to filter the entire workspace for me to show me only iPad traffic. So if I didn't have to go back to the segment builder, I, I in this case I'm not building the iPad segment as something I'm going to save for all time going into the future. But if I just wanted to treat the iPad users as a segment very quickly, uh, that's I'm able to do that by simply dragging and dropping a dimension onto the onto the workspace. And I could do the same thing down here if I wanted to uh, build a segment on the fly of iPad traffic. I can drag that dimension down here and I can say, all right, how does iPad perform uh, alongside whatever other segments I'm looking at? Uh, taking this a step further, if I were interested in looking at my email channel and comparing iPad to iPhone traffic across the email channel, well, in that case, just bring the iPad and iPhone dimensions under the email segment, and now I'm able to see email filtered down further through iPad and iPhone and see those side by side. So this is one of the hallmarks of Analysis Workspace. If you leave with nothing else learned about Analysis Workspace except this today, it's that it should be that when you are working with a free form table, you can, there, there are very few limits to where you can place your different dimensions, metrics, and segments, whether it's in columns or rows or nested uh, within columns and rows so that you can uh, build the report that's giving you the information that you need to see at any given time. Yeah, so in this instance, like if I could do the same thing and bring over iPad and iPhone again, or maybe you're looking at Apple versus Samsung devices, you can group and cluster in any way that you want, uh, but you get that ability to compare side by side uh, very quickly and essentially create these segments on the fly. So that is a fun capability for us to have. I'm going to delete these visualizations that I was working with because I wanted to highlight something. This is a feature, and actually, let me just scan the chat pod real, real quick here. Um, ch -ch -ch, make sure that we're, if there's anything that we need to hit, that is generally due to visit, da, da, da. All our EVARs background chart is comparing unlike metrics going down across revenue, page views, and visits. Is that intended? Uh, the, sorry, Brian, those were just the metrics that I had handy to drag into the graph. So uh, they, they will distort a visualization. If you have the values, you can normalize a visualization so that you are uh, getting the most out of, out of, your, uh, out of the, the graph that you're looking at at any given time. All right, I wanna, wanna show something. This is one of the challenges we were seeing when we first introduced Analysis Workspace was that users were not being guided towards a lot of the different visualizations that existed. We we're getting kind of locked into uh, basic graphs on top of the uh, freeform table. And so uh, in what we've done recently is introduce when you have a freeform table or a freeform uh, block inside your workspace, we make it easy for you to say start analyzing with one of these visualization options. And so far, we've been playing only with freeform table. Uh, but if we want to, uh, we're going to gonna click through basically each of these different areas and, and showcase for you the, the different elements or the different visualizations that we can work with beyond graphs. And the first two that we'll look at are fallout and flow. And these are classics. If you are a longtime site catalyst or reports and analytics user, these are ones that are now good to have inside Analysis Workspace. So we're going to start with Fallout. And the Fallout report is something that we can use to take any sequence of events or pages or any act sequence of activities and try to, or touch points. Let's think about them as touch points because that's what it says here in the UI. And we want to understand. Uh, does how where are we losing users inside a sequence so in this case I want to take my page I want to look at a sequence of pages and so let's start with the home page and I'm adding the touch point of home page and I want to say then that they go to search results then they get to the women's page and then they go to shopping cart cart details and I'll say finally order confirmation and so I'm, and then I'm gonna get rid of all visits at the top I believe I do that uh, here 
I'm going to remove all visits because I don't want to start there. I want to start with just visitors who started on the home page. And I'm able to see where the fallout takes place. Uh, I have 100% of my visitors that I'm evaluating start on the home. 65% make it to the search results. 36.8% go to women's page. 30% go to the cart details page. 16% check out. And you'll notice there's a drop down menu here that says eventual path. You have the option to select eventual path or next hit. Those should be self explanatory, but if they're not, next hit, we're going to say explicitly someone went from home page to search results uh, versus at some point during their session, they went from home page to search results. And so this is all interesting and good and fine. I'm able to see. Uh, how this compares uh, across all visits. That's what we're looking at right now. Uh, but let's take our fallout report and bring back in our concept of segmentation. So I want to revisit our different marketing channels that we were looking at. Uh, I can just bring a segment into or, or bring several segments onto this uh, and you'll see how the graphs change. So here's paid search, here's email, and here's social. And so if I immediately, if I want to build a really quick uh, report comparing fallout across these different channels, uh, this is how I would be able to do that. So now I have uh, paid search, email, and social in the different graphs. And as I scroll down, I'm able to see how those different channels influence fallout across the course of the customer journey. Um, so that is a, a very useful to be able to bring those uh, segments that you've built into the into your analysis very quickly and just like we did before I'm going to remove paid search email and social if I wanted to do this with something like device type and come over to my menu here and compare these to you know tablet versus phone there was a question in there in the chat I saw about where's desktop? And that's a good question. I don't know why, like in our demo data set, we don't have a uh, desktop in here. That would be a good one to add in, I suppose. But I assume everything that's not on a mobile device type in this instance would be desktop. So that's the way that that would kind of flesh out. Uh, so you can see really quick, let's compare a tablet to a mobile phone and, and have that set up here. Um, Let's see, we had a question. Please explain the difference between using an inline segment versus seeing the segments at the top as you're demonstrating. Uh, the, you always have the ability to bring a segment into a particular report that you're looking at, whether, whether it's a table or what I'm doing right now with the free form analysis. You always can bring a segment into that, uh, that narrow focused element of the report. Uh, but if you want to think about it as throwing a blanket over the entire report, if I wanted to filter everything that I'm looking at in a workspace through a segment, that's where I would use the segment up at the top. So if I were comparing, you know, right in this instance, I want to bring into the graph and compare mobile device type tablet versus mobile phone. Uh, but if I instead wanted to, if I had, if I went back to where I had my, uh, email and paid search and my different channels in here, but I wanted to then filter those all through mobile phone. I would then lay the mobile phone blanket over the top of the entire report and, and roll that out, uh, roll that out through there. Um, we might, and we might need to follow up with you. I see your follow up comment Aaron. the numbers will be different, uh, as to what exactly you might be seeing in your instances there. Um, is that channel report the recommended way to analyze channels? So the channel report as we have it set up in this demo environment, it really becomes a, a method of how you are uh, collecting the data that's coming into your, in, in your particular implementation. So you generally would have a tracking code that is being used on the campaigns that are being brought into your site. And then we would use classifications later on to take that tracking code and classify it as being email channel or, uh, or Facebook. You know, you might, in this case, in my instance, I have social as a catch all, uh, but you could just as easily say, this is Facebook, this is Twitter, this is uh, Instagram, this is Pinterest. And so you can use classifications to break down and filter out, uh, your, uh, your reports, however you, however you would like. I'm getting a quip up there about my notifications. That is a lot of maintenance that's been taking place that I get notified about. I, it's also 
doesn't help that I have access to like eight accounts that I probably get duplicate notifications on, but definitely appreciate the uh, call out uh, right there. All right, so that is a, a kind of, we just took a, a look into the fallout analysis and, and how that can be used for you. Uh, one thing that you, the breakdowns carry over here. So let me take a step back real quick. I just want to bring back over social and email for the heck of it to add some color to the report. If I have a particular area that I want to do some further analysis, uh, let's say I'm losing 43% of my traffic here at the women's page. If I want to, I, for one thing, I could create a segment and go do some further analysis. So if I create a segment in this instance, it's going to show me first touch channel, they came through email, and then the page was home, then search results, and then women. Uh, it's building that segment out for me. Uh, the other thing that I can do when I break down here, though, is say I want to break down the fallout at this touch point. And that's going to create a table for me and show me with that criteria of visitors who came through email and then fell out at that particular page, I'm going to be able to see what pages did they go to. So they fell out of my flow, where did they go next instead? Uh, so you're able to get that, that deeper analysis and that visualization into uh, where else on the site they're going. If you were, again, this is a a report that was a hallmark of Site Catalyst and getting it brought in and having the additional flexibility to uh, start bringing in segments on the fly is is really helpful inside Analysis Workspace. So that was Fallout. A close analog to Fallout is the Flow Report. Again, another Site Catalyst classic that has been updated for, for the new age. And what we can do in this instance is we can look at how users are flowing through the site. Uh, this is another good avenue to start building in uh, segments or overlaying segments to compare traffic flow uh, between, different, uh, be between different users. So in this instance, if I want to uh, see the flow from the home page, how did users get into the home page versus where did they go next, uh, I can start clicking through and building out essentially a path or, uh, or a journey. So when going from the home page to the women's page to the store locator, if at any portion here I build a path, and so I say they got to the store results page, I could create a segment of users who followed through on that path. If I want to focus in, right now my focus is on the home page, but if I want to go into that store results page and focus on that node, I am able to do that and kind of restart the analysis uh, from that perspective. Uh, but this gives you that visualization into where users are navigating. And you get like the top five results, but if you need to expand it out into more, uh, you, have, you can keep doing that. So you, you build out the, the octopus, the tentacles of the octopus graph, if that's what it's actually called, um, into as much detail as you want as you continue on. And so one thing that I like to do in these instances uh, is I'll, I'll compare uh, two flow charts right next to each other. So let me, you can either do this, stack them on top of each other. I've got my browser zoomed in a little bit for the aid of the viewing audience, uh, but let me shrink you a little bit here. And I come to my visualizations and I can add another flow chart. And we might do a comparison, like we might build out two flow we compare two segments to each other is something that I might do in that instance. So if I want to compare mobile traffic to desktop traffic and see how they're navigating my content differently, uh, that's something that I might do in that instance. I do have the ability to look at this on a visit or visitor basis. So think back to the concept of our uh, segment building. We can look at how does flow happen within the context of a single visit. Or if we want to look at it from a visitor perspective where behavior could take place across multiple sessions, then we might look at it at the visitor level. So you have both of those options available to you. And I'm going to return that to the default height, actually get rid of that. Uh, so you have the, that's the flow report that's available to you as well. Um, I'm going to come back to cohort table in a, in a little bit. Uh, show sorry, a question from James. What happened to show trends and hide trends for graphs visualizations? 
those do those should still be there I think believe I saw those earlier James let's just take a quick look here uh, address that so I, I bring in my page dimension and I'm just gonna bring over the page views and visits metrics and if I click on one of these let me visualize it with a line graph So you have a trend, there is the trend selection option that you can build in. Um, I don't know about the, the hide trend, we can look into that for you. And, and, and on any of these questions that I'm saying, we'll look into it for you. I, I swear to you, if you email me, and you should all have my email, srigs at adobe.com, uh, if we can't answer something for you in the chat, please email me and we'll follow up with you on any, any questions that are left outstanding from today. Yeah, well, that's something that I, I know John just said he's not sure, so perhaps it's something we can look into a little bit further. Um, we are going to come back to the cohort table. I want to look at histogram. Histogram is kind of a fun one that was recently added in. And in this case, we're going to bring a metric into the histogram, and I want to look at orders. So I bring over the orders histogram, and... All right, that's kind of fun. We're looking at, we see a, like 2,085 of our unique visitors have one to three orders, and then it, it falls off very quickly after that. Uh, but I come into my visualization settings, and I can change my, uh, my buckets. So if I want to go down to a, a bucket of just one order, so I want to build different uh, buckets, maybe I want to start my buckets off of, off of two, uh, shoot, this is not orders is just so skewed towards a single order. Maybe let's do it with something different. Uh, let's look at it in terms of page views. Hopefully that will give us a little bit. Here we go. Yeah, this is a better visualization. So we are looking at number of page views. And I can see I've got a long tail and I got kind of a lot of people at one and it just kind of generally shrinks and we go down to a long tail. Uh, but I can come and I can change my histogram and I can change the number of buckets that I have. So if I want to group page views in groups of five, uh, we can look at this at the visit or visitor, uh, probably not hit on a page view metric because that would give us a lot of ones. Uh, but we can we can group these however we want. And this uh, this becomes useful to us in just starting to group uh, users together and see, you know, what does the what does the span of traffic look like or what does the behavior of the traffic look like? across the different uh, across the different visitor sets that are coming on of course can change the number of buckets that we have and so you can build that out um, not not earth-shattering what we're seeing in terms of the histogram but if you're looking into building a dashboard uh, this can be a nice uh, a nice uh, visualization to have uh, as you're building out your dashboard um, I want to see here if I can I this is an area where I can apply a segment in this instance, it doesn't allow you to apply a segment onto the, the unique visitors like we could in some of the other reports uh, into the actual graph, but you can filter your, your histogram or your entire panel uh, by, by that. So if I wanted to compare uh, the number of page views of social visitors to email visitors, for example, well, in that instance, I'm just going to bring over a second freeform panel. So maybe I'm building a dashboard in this instance. And I come in and I say, let me give me another histogram. Give me the, um, what did we do here? We did page views. And I want to apply my email segment to that. Now I can compare email, the histogram of email unique visitors and page views to social unique visitors and page views side by side. So that's a way that you would be able to compare those different graphs to each other right next to each other. So that's histogram, kind of fun little uh, addition. I'm going to come back and add in another panel here. Uh, Venn diagram is good for comparing uh, segments and metrics. So in this instance, I'm able to add up to three segments and then a metric, and we're going to do some comparisons to each other. So I've been playing with our, our campaign traffic. So let's go social, email, and paid search ads. And I want to look across the revenue metric. And I build that out. And this is going to show us where it's going to show us comparison. Looks like there's no overlap in visitors in this instance because the 
Uh, these are unique campaigns that users are coming in from. So that's why we see no overlap there. Uh, if I come back to, let's close that visualization and try a different uh, segment here. What I want to look at in this instance is frequent visitors. I uh, want to look at visitors who hit the kids category page and visitors who hit the men's or women's category page. And then in this instance, let's look at revenue and see if we have any overlap. And so now I see I have, I have some overlap that's built in there and I can get kind of a quick idea of what that overlap looks like. I'm going to show you another example of a cool Venn diagram in just a few minutes when we run a report that's called Segment IQ. So stay tuned. Uh, the last visualization that I want to show here is brand new, and this is Map. And Map is going to give you two different options. One is for geographic dimension, so we're going to be basing the what we show on the map in terms of the IP address. If you have uh, the SDK, the Adobe Mobile SDK installed uh, on your mobile apps, and you're, so you're using mobile services, then mobile latitude and longitude would be enabled here as well. So you would be able to utilize latitude and longitude on mobile devices for the report that I'm about to show you. But in this instance, what we're going to do is we're going to bring a metric on. So let's say I want to look at orders. And I'm afraid that this is going, because of my sample data set, this is going to show all San Jose. Uh, but hopefully you can get, if, you, you, if you're using Analysis Workspace, you can get in and start playing with this and, and see, yeah, this is going to show all San Jose. Uh, but ultimately it's a, it's a map, as you would expect, that you could zoom in on in any particular area and see where your, where your observances of the particular metric that you're looking at are being recognized. Uh, so in this case, it's all going to be San Jose, unfortunately, uh, but your data set will absolutely vary because it's not all fake generated data. So definitely would encourage you to play with the map visualization. Last one that I'll show before I go into uh, you know, some, I want to show calculated metrics and um, then we will uh, maybe do a lightning round of questions coming up. Uh, the cohort table. Cohort table is uh, sometimes takes a little bit to wrap your mind around in how it could be useful to you. But or, I found that organizations who find a good use case for the cohort table are getting a lot of value out of it in terms of just getting a better understanding of their traffic. So what we see when we come to cohort table is we start with uh, our granularity. Uh, right now I'm looking at a report that's showing me this month, so November 1st through November 30th. And so I don't want to look at the report I'm building in terms of a month of granularity. I want to show it in a week. You'll see what that means in just a moment. But I come to the inclusion metric. And so what we're going to ask is when a certain value of an inclusion metric or a certain number of instances of a metric are observed, we're going to put all of those instances into a cohort, and then we want to look at when and how often after the uh, initial metric was observed does a return metric happen. So very simple example of this is if we have one or more page views from a visitor, do they return and complete one or more orders? So the inclusion metric is page view. We see a page view, then they come back and they order. So I must say I want to build this report, and here's what I get. I have cohorts because we did a week granularity of October 29th through November 4th, November 5th through November 11th, and so forth. We see the number of people in each of those cohorts, so the number of instances where we saw each of those page, uh, at least one page view, and then we see a week after the fact how many orders happened, two weeks after the fact how many orders happened, three weeks after the fact how many orders happened. So what's interesting to me that pops out, because thanks to the colorization here, November 12th through November 18th, we had 1,480 people with, uh, at, there was 1,480 people with at least one page view. And within that week, 203 people came back and completed an order. So this is good for me to know top line, um, when is a certain metric that we're observing influencing behavior downstream. It, this is good to have in a dashboard, but if I wanted to do something to start to take action on this right away, uh, this is a good instance where I would say I want to create a segment. So I would create a segment from that cell and takes us to the segment builder. And much like before, we have the criteria week equals November 12th through November 18th, page views equals one, and 
week equals November 19th through 25th. So they came back in that next week and orders equaled one. Um, I, I think I might need to change that and modify that to greater than or equal to because that's what I was in my talk track. That's what I was saying to you guys. So I would say greater than or equal to one. But that's uh, what you see there. That's how you can take the cohort analysis and then apply it out to some other analysis that you're trying to do. So if you have any questions around use cases or thoughts, I'd love to see those shared um, after today, you know, how you're using cohort tables. Uh, but it's a probably a lesser used capability within analysis workspace. But again, if you find one of those good use cases for it, uh, there can be a lot of power for you. Okay, so I'm just going to do a quick scan through the chat here. I sure appreciate Matt and John and Steve for, and uh, any other Adobe folks in here for helping uh, keep this live for me, keep uh, track of the, the chat pods uh, that you all, uh, there are all the questions that you guys are having. So it looks like they are on top of things. Um, I'm gonna, what I want to do next is we're going to go back to some free form table. And I'm going to show you, now if I were doing a demonstration to sell you Adobe Analytics. I realize most of you, probably the majority of people here are existing Adobe Analytics customers. Uh, the Probably the coolest, most useful feature within all of Analysis Workspace, aside from the flexibility of reporting and everything, is the, the, the fact that anomaly detection is built in natively. And we really haven't explored this yet. Um, but what I wanna do here is let's go back to the products report. And I'm going to do, again, page views, orders, and revenue. So build this out for me. You'd think if I were a wise man, I'd have saved this so I could just come back to it. But we're doing things on, we're doing things live. So uh, we'll do it this way. So I have my page views, orders, and revenue. And I'm going to bring over a line visualization. And inside the line visualization, you are always going to have anomaly detection natively built into this for you. And so what anomaly detection is, and I hope this shows up okay on the, uh, across the screen share. If I hover over the line, right now the line I'm hovering over the green one is page views. There is a dotted line in the background. We have a solid line. The solid line is the observed values. So it's what we saw every day. The dotted line in the background is the expected values based on our uh, machine learning statistical model. That's the expected value that we would see on any given day. And so you can kind of see that trend. I'll tell you that expected value that the model has been refined over the past several months to take in seasonality, holidays, weekends. Uh, so it is, it's, a, it's a pretty intelligent model to show you um, the expected values at any given time. And then there's a shaded green line that expands above and below the dotted line. That's uh, within statistical, that's the kind of the statistical confidence around the dotted line. So think about it as 99% statistical confidence. That's what I believe uh, we would be seeing in this instance. And I'll show you in alerts how you can configure that. Um, but anytime an observed value is falling outside of that expected range, we are flagging that as an anomaly. So in this instance, if page views are abo above or below what we would have expected on that given day, we're gonna let you know that there was something out of the ordinary. And now depending on, uh, if you're on a current version of, of Adobe Analytics Analysis Workspace, you might see this uh, an analyze link here. And what this allows you to do is run a contribution analysis. And so if I click on analyze, uh, we are going to be able to run an analysis that will give us a deep dive into um, all the factors that led into that spike in page views on that given day. Uh, that, depending on the amount of data that's going into that analysis, it can take a couple of minutes or, you know, I don't want to be presumptive. If you have a gigantic data set, uh, it might take more than a couple of minutes. But you see mine here took about 20 seconds, and it's going to pop up with a number of reports for me. Uh, that are going to show me some details around what factored in to that page views, which was 16,500 or so on that day. I'm able to see the dimensions that we observed and how the contribution score is essentially a normalized uh, R value, or it's your, it's your correlation 
Uh, it doesn't you don't see positive and negative correlation. You kind of have to imply based on whether it was a uh, a good anomaly, like we were getting higher than expected page views, or a negative anomaly, which would be lower than expected page views, whether your contribution score is positive or negative correlation. Uh, but you kind of see that in the correlation score. So we see day of years, the 307th day of the year, contribution score of one. Well, of course, we are observing values on a particular day, so we should expect high correlation there. Same with the day of the month. Uh, but then we get down into some of the additional details. Don't know why. Uh, something quirky in my data set showing that month of year November has less than one correlation. Uh, but you're, you can start to dig in to the factors that led to that, uh, that anomaly. So just to help you do some further analysis in that regard. And so that's the anomaly detection that is just natively built in to the reports that you are, uh, that you are looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so that is always there for you. Encourage you to to give that a check as you're playing along. Uh, that is a capability that we would consider part of Adobe Sensei, which is our AI capabilities that are part of the uh, the marketing cloud. Another another Sensei capability that I'll demonstrate for you here really quick is something called segment comparison. And segment comparison, let me shrink that contribution analysis that we just did here. Something I haven't showed you, we can collapse these panels. So if you want to have many different panels on your dashboard and keep it nice and clean, you're able to do so. Um, I'm gonna run another report here called segment comparison so that you know where to find this. It's at the top left. There's a panels icon and one of the panels is called segment comparison. So you drag that on. And what this is going to allow you to do is compare one segment to another. And so in this instance, I want to compare mobile device traffic. And so I bring over mobile device traffic. It's by default going to give me the complement of mobile device as my compare against. So I can compare mobile device against everyone else. Uh, but in this instance, I want to compare mobile device against frequent visitors. Why not? So I'm gonna build the segment comparison and much like we just saw with the contribution analysis, uh, we're, we're doing some data crunching in the background. It's going to take a few seconds, uh, but we're going to spit out a series of reports that can help you understand the differences and similarities between these two segments. This is, uh, if, if your level of Adobe Analytics, again, check with your account executive uh, or your account manager. Uh, this is not part, depending on the contract you're on, this is not part of every, every tier, but uh, we can help you identify if it is. Um, you're gonna see the size and overlap of the two different segments. So mobile device, I have 1,200 unique visitors. Frequent visitors, it's 2346. There's 207 people that overlap between those two segments. Well, let's dive deeper into the similarities and differences between those segments. Uh, the first report we get is top metrics against segments. So we are looking at different metrics that we are tracking and we can see how similar or different are they between those two segments we were analyzing. So if I look at total cost per visitors or things like revenue per visitor, uh, and I can see wh where is that metric higher or lower across the segments that I'm looking at. This is super, this is super interesting for me to look at because I, it starts to help me understand where our high value segments are. If I have, if I have my social media team and my email team at each other's throat over which one is more effective at driving revenue. And they both have, they've both been in Adobe analytics and they've put together some reports that help prove their points. If I want to just quickly build segments of each of the traffic coming from those different channels and look holistically at how they compare against each other, this is good for me. Uh, you can really start to understand, you know, where the winners and losers are in your across your different segments. But more importantly, you can start to understand if there are areas where you're duplicating efforts from a marketing perspective. You can also look if there are areas that of opportunity. So uh, some areas where we can get deeper into that is I come down and instead of looking at metrics across segments, I'm looking at all of our dimensions and seeing when those dimensions are observed across the different segments. So do we see, this is kind of a silly one, but uh, traffic coming from unique, uh, mobile device versus frequent visitors on the weekend versus uh, the, during the week, during the work week. Uh, we, we see the, the breakdown 
across all of our different dimensions and we can make those comparisons. Uh, the final one though that I'd like to show is top segments against segments. And this is super interesting to me. I, I hope it is to you all as well. This uh, module will take all of your other segments that exist and show you of the two, and I get tongue twisted saying segment so much here, of the two segments you're comparing, in this instance mobile device and frequent visitors, what segments do they overlap with most often? So you may find, and I look here, I see frequent visitors are frequently hitting, and uh, there's a huge overlap with visiting the men or women category page. Uh, I see there's very little overlap between mobile device and paid search traffic. I can really start to see where those, where that overlap looks. I might identify areas where I have segments that I'm marketing to differently, but they actually behave very similarly inside my ecosystem. Uh, you, you can just, I, I spend a lot of time when I uh, sit down with customers, not in a, in a fake generated data set like I'm with right now, but I'm using actual real customer data. We can spend an hour or hours looking at this and just talking through why or why not you're seeing overlap between these different segments. So I would uh, definitely encourage anyone who has this capability to, to run the report and spend some time uh, diving into it. So that is the segment comparison. All right. Now this is the point of the, the workshop. I know we have about 20, 35 minutes left. I want to start backtracking over some of the things I said we'll, we'll be getting to that I haven't got to yet. So one of those, remember back at the very beginning of the session, I brought in a report into report pages. And I was looking at page views, orders, and revenue. And I said, well, look here. You see that there are 2,089 orders and $1.8 million of revenue being generated on the order confirmation page, but we don't see any orders and revenue on the other pages. And the reason for that is we pass in the value of the order and the revenue on the order confirmation page. But what if I'm sitting here and I'm saying, hey, I want to know what pages generate, helped lead toward that, that conversion or help drive people towards converting? So this is an area where we're going to apply a calculated metric. We haven't dive into calculated metrics right now, but calculated metrics are super cool. So think about, we talked about metrics earlier. A lot of these are defined at the implementation level through tag management. You're, you're collecting these quantitative metrics of what's happening on your site, page views, orders, revenue, uh, time on site, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but of all of those metrics that you are collecting at kind of at that baseline, you can then start to create uh, calculated versions of those. And to do so, you come to your new menu up at the top and say you want to create a metric. And you have a metric builder here where you can apply your different uh, components. And then there are a number of functions that you can apply to your metrics as well. Um, not Definitely not going to go through all of these, but you can see over on the left side that you have the ability to uh, calculate percentiles or averages. Uh, there's some advanced functions that go way above my uh, my head in terms of of how they would be used. I know there are there are some different definite experts out there in the hashtag measure community who can uh, help walk you through and talk through the areas where you might use some of these advanced functions. Uh, but just know there is a gigantic amount of um, there's a gigantic amount of capability that comes through being able to create these different functions or these different calculated metrics. So if I bring over, I start bringing over some different dimensions like page views and if for some silly reason I wanted to do the square root of page views, you know, I would be able to create a, a calculated metric in that fashion. But let's go back to our use case of wanting to uh, attribute the uh, orders and revenue across all of the pages that users experienced during their session leading up to conversion. Uh, well, in this case, I'm going to create what we call a participation metric. And so I'm going to take the orders metric, and this one's pretty simple. Over here on the in the configuration, there's a gear icon. Let me remove my video so you can see this. There's a gear icon over here on the right side of the metric. 
and there's a drop down menu called allocation and we are going to choose how we're going to allocate uh, this metric across uh, different criteria. So we might allocate based on the marketing channel. We might allocate across the entire reporting window that we are looking at. In this case, I'm going to choose what's called visit participation. And by choosing visit participation, I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it uh, webinar orders visit participation. I'm calling it webinar orders visit participation because I think I've created this before. I'm just going to save that and pardon me quickly while I do the same thing for revenue. So I'll call this webinar revenue participation. And so I'm again real quick, revenue, gear icon, allocation, visit participation, save. I come back to my report now and I'm going to bring these over. So let's in orders, next to orders, let's look at visit participation. And revenue, next to revenue, let's look at visit participation. And so we now, you see there's values inside all of these different pages. We are assigning credit to the pages where orders and revenue were actually generated. And so if I sort my values here, you're going to notice that that 2089 value, so 100% of orders, we see that uh, recognized across all the shopping cart steps. You would expect that because someone who completed an order and they got to that order confirmation page where we recognize the order as a variable in Adobe Analytics, they also hit all four steps of the checkout process. So that's why we see 100% there. But as we scroll down through values like the home page, search results, and gear page, not 100% of orders hit each of those pages, but we can see what percentage and what number of orders did hit those pages. And so that's the exact same thing over on revenue. So you're, you're able to attribute revenue, attribute orders, attribute any other metric on a participation basis to the actual pages that actually were part of the, of the, the conversion or of the customer journey that led to the conversion. And uh, I'm going to just go ahead and guess that of the audience today that, you know, there's a lot of you that may organizationally be aware of participation metrics and using, but I find time and time again that there's a lot of organizations who are not using participation metrics who just didn't even know that they exist. So, and there's, you're always thinking about attribution, being able to get a better, better use of, uh, of the tool and understand what pages and what campaigns and everything are leading to a conversion. So that is a very quick way that exists for everyone right now that you can start uh, getting more value out of your orders and revenue metrics uh, than, you've, than you've used already. So uh, please, if you have any questions, pop those in. I, I know I believe Matt and John have some expertise with uh, participation metrics. So I would encourage you to check those out. Another one that I want to show you uh, back on calculated metrics, just to give you another flavor of how these can be useful to you is a, I'm gonna go create a new metric. Think about if I have, I have a custom, customer IDs and I want to know, well, how I have customer IDs, but how many unique customers do I have? Uh, one of the functions I talked about, I don't know what all these functions do, uh, but there's a function that was introduced this last summer, I believe, called approximate count distinct and this is a fun one to start playing with and what this will do is it will take any metric or, or sorry any dimension that you are working with and will calculate the number of distinct values of that of that metric so if I say I have customer IDs for example I can come and bring over customer ID into that and I can say you know it's a unique customers by ID. So now we're not looking at unique visitors, which there could be some variation based on cookies and devices and so forth. We're going to say, let's look at all the instances of customer IDs and understand where, where those differences are. So now I, I might have a uh, unique customer. I can bring, sorry, I can bring that metric in as well. And so I can see what do our, what does our traffic look like or how many unique customers did we see across each of these different pages. 
So that's uh, just another example of a calculated metric. There's there's some documentation out there around the different functions that you can dive into. If you are a data scientist or just a statistician, I'm sure you are uh, more intelligent than I am and can find, uh, find uses for the different functions. But the idea is you are, as an analyst, not locked into what's being collected through the implementation in how you're able to make this data work for you. You're also not forced to take this data all into Excel or into R. You certainly can. You can export all your analytics data into Excel via Report Builder or into R using the uh, R Site Catalyst package that's uh, supported by Randy Zwitch and, uh, and other community members out there. Uh, but you have the ability to uh, do some uh, advanced uh, metric creation directly within Analysis Workspace. So definitely would encourage you to uh, check that out as well. All right. Fernando says there are very advanced statistical functions inside calculated metrics. Definitely. That's what I, that's what I was getting at. So uh, can we export the line level data using functions? I'm not sure on that one. I cannot see the functions option. Just, I just see dimensions, metrics, segments, and time. How can I now? One thing I want to check on is, I see that question, Jonathan, that you don't see the functions. There's a, the in a recent change, this is another area, and this is, for better or for worse, this is an area that uh, a lot of answers to questions around functionality depend on the, the contract that you're on. So there may be some contracts, we can look into what level of contract you're on, uh, that uh, you may be on an older version or not a current contract or something that uh, has uh, an advanced version of calculated metrics versus a uh, more basic version that lets you do just the kind of add, subtract, multiply, deply, divide, etc., and so forth. So it depends, yeah, Matt says, depends on the AA bundle. Uh, we can look into that for you if you'd like us to. All right, so I have ran through the gamut of content that I would like to show here. Uh, I would like to, if there's items in the chat uh, that we, we'd like to see demonstrated, we can be very ad hoc from here forward. Otherwise, we can start to wrap up uh, today's session. Uh, this has been fun for me. As a, like I say, this was an experiment, first time to see if this is a good format for us to be able to share. So definitely would love the feedback uh, if anyone if you guys got use out of this and this was useful for you to learn a little bit more about analysis workspace and if you'd like to see this see us do this with other solutions in the future I uh, would certainly uh, like to hear that um, can we see a functionality menu I'm not sure what you mean by that Jonathan if you can uh, give me a little bit more clarity what you mean there uh, I'm just going to scroll through the chat here as we start to wrap up and see if there's anything that would be fun for me to show in our remaining time. Is there any way to see that overlap among other segments as you're creating a new segment, or do you need to build them to see? Yeah, the, the overlap of segments comes through the segment IQ analysis. So there, as of today, there's no on-the-fly uh, type of overlap, at least within the Adobe Analytics Analysis Workspace interface. Um, if we have an advanced data science tool called Data Workbench that is uh, available as an add-on that some advanced organizations are using, uh, I believe that would have more on-the-fly capabilities to show you overlap in terms of, of segments that you're looking at, but that's not something that exists within data, uh, Analysis Workspace today. So Gabe, uh, to that question that you had there. Um, Thank you for this great webinar. Hey, I'm happy to do this. The, this video will definitely be available to watch again. It just takes a little bit of time to process after we end it, but the video will be available and we'll share that with the uh, Adobe Analytics team. So it will be on their YouTube channel as well. Can we export the line level data using functions? There, da, da, da. Use case for demo. Break down top 10 products by top five marketing channels by top two device types in a way that is dynamic based on date range, current top product. All right, let's uh, challenge accepted, Braden. Uh, let's try this. So I want to let me go to a new workspace for this just to keep it clean. So in this instance, let me get back to that chat that you had there. Uh, top ten products. 
my top five marketing channels. So let's start with product. So you have a couple of different ways that we could do this right off the bat. One way would be I, I can either bring my marketing channels as items across the top. And I could do that as segments or as the uh, just the value, the dimensions of channels. I'm going to use last touch channels here. So you could either just to, I'm just going to illustrate that what I'm talking about here for you. I could either bring the channels over. Why am I getting invalid there? Not sure. Just playing here on the fly. Maybe first touch channel. Just getting an air as I try to build this. And product might not be recognizing that data. I don't know why. All right. Is product populating? Product's populating. Well, let's try it this way then. Let's do a breakdown. And perhaps I want you, so you say top 10 products. Um, so we're going to take, we have none. That's a value just where there's no, it's an artifact of our, our data set. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to break down these values by the dimension of channel. So let's say first touch. So I'm doing a breakdown there across these different. I know you wanted the top five. It's giving us the, the seven. So you can, uh, I'm not sure if I can eliminate this or or eliminate that display only yeah I could say I want to display only selected rows so there's a little bit of setup here on the front end in terms of setting this up uh, but then you want to break down by the top two device types so let's take this here as well and we're gonna do a breakdown uh, dimensions by device type so now we have our device types that are showing up and again we would need to go through and massage the had the visual to show if you if you really only wanted to see the top two uh, rows you just need to go through and make that uh, that modification uh, but then for a rolling basis what we're going to do is we are going to select the date range that we want uh, so if it is by you know the last week or the last, you know, let's just say the last week or the last seven days and use rolling dates, then we can apply that to our panel. And so every time we come into this report, we're going to see our top reports or our top products by channel, by device type. And so that's, I stacked the breakdowns in that fashion. You could mix and match in how you display those. So perhaps you have products and marketing channels uh, up at the top. Uh, across your columns and then you do your breakdowns of phone of device types inside the products menu might be a little bit more clean uh, but you're certainly able to get to a type of report like that uh, that you would have going forward uh, how do you expand device types down through the report it was only applied to boots now so the that's the and it may be Matt or John if you guys know there's not a maybe if I had selected that's where I'm saying there's a little bit of setup that would be required right off the bat. I guess I could say, do I want, if I select all of these, and maybe if I select, so there's the extreme parka, and then there's, if I come in and select all those different values and then do a breakdown by device type. Yeah, so there's, they're only allow, allowing it to happen under one product at once. I'm not sure if that's something that's a definite, definitely a good feature because it is a it is a little bit tedious to come through and and get you to that visualization uh, or that uh, that preferred setup of the report on each individual product. So it's looking like right now that that would be a, a manual process. Uh, the good news is once you do it once, it's set. So you can you save the project and it's available to you later on. Um, but I'm wondering, I'll, I'll take back to our, our product team and ask them if that's something that they've looked at or if there's a functional reason that they don't allow selection of multiple breakdowns under multiple products and then can do another breakdown um, by, you know, the similar items. So hopefully I'll definitely take that feedback, Braden. 
if you could take this case back to the product team, that's the very reason I have not migrated. From, so that is in ad hoc and does not exist in workspace. So yeah, uh, we'll definitely mention to Ben and Jim that that's a capability that you'd like to see. How about, about making a bar or line graph as in previous versions? So if we are on this instance here, we have our report that we're looking at. And if I, all I have to do is right click and say visualize and I can add in my bar graph. And if, as mentioned before, if we had multiple data sources, uh, we would be able to select the data source that we are utilizing for the uh, for the graph. Uh, but it is going to update based on the data that I'm looking at or have selected at any given moment inside the report. Uh, you have the ability uh, to either build your visualization um, by right clicking and saying visualize or there is a little icon that hovers over here where you can it, see it says that little graph and I can visualize click that and it will visualize and so I can bring multiple visualizations in uh, for the same report that we're looking at or if you prefer you can come to the visualizations menu over on the left side and drag and drop the particular version or the particular graph that you're interested in looking at at the given moment. Let's see. I've got something to do. I'm just reading your chat comments here. Just show it here if there is one available during the session. Sometimes it takes a while to load. Any best practices are welcome. What was the previous conversation that you had there? A complete dashboard analysis you did and show it to us. I'll see if I have one. I I do so much of my, I build messy things like this and then I delete the, the dashboards. I don't know that I've ever shown a, or saved like a real full on uh, dashboard, but I definitely can send some examples. Um, one of the fun, one of the fun things that you can do is when you, I actually never got into sharing the uh, share capabilities here with you. So I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. I can share a PDF that's really nicely formatted. Uh, so if you need to distribute something throughout your organization. All right. Uh, when using week in column and changing dates, columns don't change with selected time period. Any workaround and breakdown product by month, is there a way to compare time periods year over year for each month? Uh, when you So the time periods that you put into a column, as far as I know, those are going to be, because you're, you're taking a time element, um, that's static unless it's something I, I think it's something like the last th the last time let's try creating a new time period that's relative so we say I want a date range and I could say I want to use roll so you have the ability to do rolling dates so if I said I want to do the last 14 days and I bring that into a date range builder and you're saying this I, I admit it I admit that I don't know the behavior here if it's uh, so if you drag a build it even if I built something like last 14 days and built it into the uh, into a into a time element and then drag that into a column the behavior of the column would remain static uh, I think that's what you're saying um, we can definitely look into that I've seen none in many of your reports, and it's in one of ours as well. Can you explain what that means and how and why it shows in product reports? So none is a none is an element that shows up when there is no value. So uh, if I have a product that there's there's a, observances of an occurrence, but there's no value. So think about like you have a a page view or a visit, uh, but there's no there's no uh, product name associated with it. Um, there's that's when none might show up. Uh, so if I have, it's just basically there's an absence of a value that would get populated into that. Uh, that may be a, a function of an implementation issue where the, the there's no value that's being passed along. Uh, there, there could be any other number of reasons that it could show up. Uh, this is an area where doing a kind of an audit of your implementation and there are services out there like observe point that can do this very economically uh, to do a scan and check to make sure that the data you're expecting to come in on your tags is actually flowing in uh, you'd be able to start to uncover maybe some of the instances that are leading to uh, an excess of none values like in my instance here i know that this is it's a the data set that i'm using is not the greatest on the planet there's a lot of 
a lot of people, a lot of my colleagues are in here and we make modifications and we, we do little tweaks and so it makes it, there's a lot of little anomalies like that that cause issues. But in the real world, if you're seeing in a, in a, in a high number of nuns, it might be something you want to look into in terms of, of an implementation issue. Uh, da, 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 da. How can we handle low traffic scenario? So by low traffic, do you mean if you are, I'm not sure what you mean by low traffic, Shree, if you can maybe share a little bit more about that. Uh, our team has a group of analysts that work on various reports, only our managers and admin. What is the best practice for collaboration where our team can save over each other's? So this is, we have organizations. In fact, there's a, we, we, there are organizations with hundreds of users who are either in analysis workspace or hope to be in analysis workspace. And so for one, you have the ability to share a project. Uh, you can share. So if I, let's say that I have built this big dashboard or this big report and I want to share with a team uh, or individuals, I'm able to share that dashboard with users and they're going to have access to be able to, uh, to view what I've shared with them. Uh, this kind of goes back to that uh, project management page that we had seen before. So if I come to manage projects uh, on the Workspaces homepage, you would be able to see uh, in out workspaces that have been owned by you, or you can see ones that are from other owners or ones that are shared across the organization. So that in that instance, I would recommend... Uh, kind of a best practice here would be if you have an admin that's created kind of a master dashboard, but you want to do some of your own slicing and dicing, you can copy it. So let's say I have this We Outdoor dashboard. What I might do is check it and say I want to copy it. Now I can rename that and have my own copy, and I can start doing my own analysis off of. So that would be a good practice. I've seen uh, a lot of administrators who will do that process for their organization. They'll go through and they'll create copies of dashboards that have um, individuals names uh, in the name of the dashboard and so that's the one that they can go through and they can and they can start playing around with and making their modifications um, so that is one element that you can do from a governance perspective to be able to uh, create this out and, and share so if I take and then if I want to take this uh, project that I've created I can come in and I can share it across the entire organization or utilizing my user groups or individual users uh, that set up at the, the Adobe Analytics admin level, you're able to determine who you're going to share access to that project out with. Uh, so that's probably the biggest thing that you can do from a governance perspective. One other thing that I hadn't covered before and I want to highlight before we break for today, if I come into this We Outdoor dashboard here, um, we have the, if I come to share a particular report, your options for sharing are as follows. Uh, we just looked at sharing a project. What comes with that? I also can say I want to get the project link. This does require users to log in, but if I have built a workspace and I just want to send it over Slack to a colleague to have them look at real quick, I can just send them the link and they would be able to do that. Again, that does require them to log in to Adobe Analytics. I can send a CSV or a PDF of the uh, workspace that I'm working with two different users. I can send on a schedule. So if I want my workspace to go out daily or hourly or weekly or whatever other time frames are available, I can have a schedule C CSV or PDF distributed. And then the final option you'll see inside share is something called curate project data. And what we didn't cover this, but this is kind of cool. Imagine if I had built a workspace with some segments and some dimensions and some metrics, and you can see, think about this would get overwhelming because look at the number of dimensions that I have. It's kind of, it's kind of comical how, mu how messy this is in terms of the amount of dimensions that have been created in this instance. If I'm sharing this with a man like my boss and they don't want to be burdened with all of this noise, what I can do is I can say I want to curate the project data and only share what I had included in the project. So they would still be able to manipulate the report and play with and see the dynamic visualizations and such, but they would only be able to do so within the context of the dimensions, metrics, and segments that I had included or curated inside the project. So that's another helpful element inside the 
uh, in the sharing options that are available to you. All right. Just reading here. Uh, definitely Braden on the comment. I uh, ad hoc analysis is still fully supported. Uh, so, uh, but definitely the the feature cap the features of ad hoc. I would say that analysis workspace is probably at like ninety five percent parity with ad hoc analysis now, and they eventually want it to be at like one hundred and ten percent parity. Uh, and I, I'm not. I don't want to speak for the product team, but. Uh, analysis workspace is the future of Adobe Analytics. That's where all new innovations are being built, and so you'll eventually, while analysis or sorry, ad hoc analysis will continue to be supported. Uh, this is a um, this is uh, the future here. Uh, YouTube's great venue for this presentation. Our team does not have a corporate YouTube channel, and thus cannot comment. I'm logged in on my personal account, which is not ideal. That's good feedback to have. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, check the Adobe help section for low traffic. All right. So we're near the end of our time. I know there may be some outstanding questions. One of the things that I learned is that, uh, the, I, while Matt and John, uh, the, the help in the chat has been phenomenal and I appreciate, uh, the, the very vibrant chat pod, um, uh, definitely would like to be able to interact a little bit more and respond more real time. So for the next one, we'll look for that. Um, PDF only fits to one page. I know there's some stuff that's being worked on. I know in the roadmap to enhance what analysis workspace looks like in the PDFs. So stay tuned on that one, Conrad. But um, please confirm while I'll post this for future viewing. So this will, I'll send out a link. The link, this YouTube link should bring you into my YouTube channel, str.adobe. Uh, you would be able to find it at the link, I believe. Uh, I will also be sending it to the Adobe Analytics YouTube channel to be able to post and also email out the link of the recording to uh, everyone who registered for this. So uh, a few different ways should be able to get that out to you. I really appreciate everyone attending this today. I've had a lot of fun, learned some things for how we can improve this method going forward into the future. Uh, but it's fun to have a, a way to interact with uh, users. I hope that you've got some uh, useful tips or learned a little bit about analysis workspace today. And I look forward to doing this again in the future. Uh, reach out with questions. My email address is srigs at adobe.com. You see my Twitter is at Tyler Adobe. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you again to John and Matt and Steve and any other Adobe colleagues who I missed inside the chat pod for helping out here. And uh, I will look forward to speaking to you all again in the future. I'm going to go get a drink of water now. Have a great day.